We're glad Casey is with us today. Let's welcome her for some comments. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully your lunch was great. Um, like Mr. Harding said, my name is Casey Kindler, and I'm with the Animal Agriculture Alliance. I'm the Director of Membership and Marketing. And really just diving in a little bit deeper to what our mission is, is we connect the animal agriculture community together through our committees, our working groups, our annual event, really arming the agriculture community with information on emerging issues so you have what you need in your pocket to really respond to those issues when they come up. Also, we engage outside of the agriculture community, which is so important. You know, the previous speaker said today, a lot of stuff is going on because people just don't really understand that, you know, agriculture is not using all the water. Maybe they have something to do with it as well. And so really engaging outside groups as well, whether that is the media, restaurant retail is a big audience for us, the food community in general, you know, making that partnership work. And then finally, what really sets us apart and what I'm really going to dive deeper into today is the animal rights activist movement. We monitor that, that movement, those groups, and really keep an eye, a watchful eye on them so we know what's the latest tactic, what's their latest strategy, what's, what are they going to come up with next to target animal agriculture and their mission to end animal agriculture ultimately. So this is one of our key resources. We just updated it uh, earlier this month. And really what it shows is how all of the animal rights groups are connected. Whether it is by funding, by project collaboration, or flow of people. A lot of times, both in agriculture and the public, uh, sometimes people think, well, HSUS, they're just you know, out to save dogs and cats. But if you look at this web, what it really illustrates is even if they go about their business with radical tactics, maybe they're protesting outside of a plant, maybe they're asking for really radical things to happen, or maybe they're in boardrooms and, and you know, making efforts with policymakers. They all go about it with different tactics, but the same agenda of making it difficult for farmers to do what they love and making it more difficult for consumers to buy what they love. Um, and so just these groups on your screen, um, there are about 30 to 40 groups here. They are the most active, the most, uh, the ones we really keep a watchful eye on. And just these groups have $800 million in annual income. So they're using that to put pressure campaigns against animal agriculture um, and really target animal agriculture and put kind of a bruise on our shoulder. And so really important to just keep tabs on these organizations, making sure that we know, again, what is their latest tactic and what can we do in the agriculture community to stand up against this. So just a few of those tactics um, I'll hit on today. Um, Everything from food and health scares to investor activism, so going to, again, the boardrooms, investors of companies and saying animal agriculture is risky, you shouldn't invest in them. Uh, celebrity activism, we've all seen the Pamela Andersons of the world on social media. Uh, mass protests and supply chain disruptions, we saw a lot of this during COVID. Once the supply chain was already disrupted, animal rights groups really took advantage of that and said, well, we're going to disrupt it even more. Uh, so we have examples of that, even down to religion, saying that the Bible says you shouldn't eat meat. So really, the whole gamut of tactics they're using against animal agriculture. Um, I'm going to dive deeper into the legislative ones later on in the presentation, but I do want to hit on just a couple before I do that. And before I do that, I do want to hit on some of these hot topics that are really impacting conversations with key opinion leaders, whether they are your legislators and policymakers, or just opinion leaders. Um, maybe it's your pastor at church, maybe didn't come from the agriculture background, and he's hearing about this Meatless Mondays thing. Um, and so really, these hot topics include animal welfare, animal agriculture and public health, antibiotic use, um, also sustainability, and the nutrition of meat, milk, dairy, eggs, uh, poultry, things like that. The first one I want to hit on is animal welfare. So the groups that we monitor are animal rights groups. They're not animal welfare groups. And so what we often see is they claim they are trying to uh, advance animal welfare or improve animal welfare. So one example of this is the Better Chicken Commitment. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Better Chicken Commitment or have heard of it? Raise of hands. So this one is a coalition that is working to, again, make the broiler chicken industry, their animal welfare standards higher. 
Seven of the groups are animal rights groups from the US. Other ones are global groups that are also animal rights groups. So these animal rights groups are coming together, making coalitions and saying, okay, here's a list of uh, welfare guidelines or welfare standards that we want these companies, restaurant retail companies, to implement. Um, take you back to that first slide. I just said that they're for animal rights, not animal welfare. So they've said that they're just using this as a stepping stone. It's just moving the goalpost. So using this as a stepping stone, say maybe it's a bigger cage today for a chicken, but ultimately it's no chicken on the plate. So that's kind of what we're working with, is you know, maybe a restaurant or retailer will say, okay, yes to this policy. Um, but that's really, again, moving that goalpost down, making it harder and harder to sell meat, milk, dairy, eggs, until they reach their end goal, which I've said is the elimination of animal agriculture. We also see, again, media stories picking up, questioning uh, animal welfare. So this is really just driving the conversation. So you need to be aware of you know, what's going on, what are people talking about in regards to animal welfare, because if you're hearing it, your legislators are hearing it, your consumers are hearing it. Um, so really just keeping tabs on what is in the news. Animal agriculture and public health. This was really uh, prevalent during the pandemic. So the pandemic hit March 2020. And animal agriculture was blamed for COVID was blamed by animal ag blamed for animal ag animal agriculture was blamed for COVID by the animal rights groups. So they said this COVID pandemic, animal ag did it. So that was the story they were trying to push. It didn't get too much traction, which was good. Um, we, you know, as the alliance and our members, we came together, put together some resources, and really went out to the media saying, "Hey, here's some expert resources saying that, you know, no one really knows where COVID came from right now, honestly." Um, but we are seeing this fester back up again, and so I want to keep your uh, keep your radar on this because just um, last week or the week before, uh, New York University and Harvard uh, Medical Harvard Law School came out with a report also talking about animal ag, public health, the next uh, pandemic might be from the US meat supply is what they claimed. And so it's coming back up. Another one tied to this is right before the pandemic, we were seeing the bubbling up of animal rights groups and other groups talking about the antibiotic usage in animal agriculture, claiming that it was rampant and, and, and things like that. Um, this is coming back up, and in that report that I just mentioned, the one from Harvard, Harvard and New York University, um, it wasn't a great report put together, so we're trying really not to drive any um, conversation to it and give it any merit. Um, but still, it was picked up by USA Today and the New York Times, and it also mentioned antibiotic use in that. So it's a topic that's going to keep festering up, and so we need to stay on top of it. Another key one is environmental sustainability. And so a lot of times, animal rights groups uh, will say that, well, not only give up meat for animal welfare, but also give it up to save the planet. Kind of that's their mantra around that. Also, the nutrition aspect, so the nutrition of meat, milk, dairy, eggs, of animal products, um, saying that you know, plant-based or vegan diets are way healthier, and the science just isn't there. But they're continuously pushing that through documentaries, through social media, through that celebrity activism, and really making it the catchy new thing, when really the goal is to take away the choice of meat, milk, dairy, and eggs. So I want to dive into just a couple tactics before I get into some legislative issues. Uh, the first one I wanted to uh, highlight was Direct Action Everywhere and their campaign of Right to Rescue. So this is a group, a very radical animal rights group based out of California. They have chapters across the United States though. And so what their key belief is, is they, they believe that they can go onto a farm and take an animal and in their eyes, they are rescuing the animal from abuse. So they trespass onto farms across the country, steal animals, and call it rescue. And so they have been uh, charged with trespassing and stealing animals, but more often than not, they are always found not guilty in the court. It's all an emotional appeal. You get in there saying that you're trying to save animals, the jury is going to go in your favor. And so we saw this in Utah when they stole two piglets from uh, a hog farm there. Um, and so, and there's another trial coming up in uh, Sonoma County, California in September where they stole chickens in 2018 and 2019. So we'll see where that goes. There was also a trial here in North Carolina, um, I think it was a backyard goat farm and they stole two or three baby goats. Um, they were convicted on that one. They were very upset because they did not get jail time. 
So they really want that attention and say, oh, I went to jail for my cause. And so it is being appealed. Um, so really the, the goal of this is to get that attention to, um, you know, grab the consumer's attention in this. All the news stories are talking about it and really make them kind of the martyr for animal rights. We've also seen uh, undercover videos still are taking place. Um, another thing is protesters. So a lot of protesting outside of plants is also a big thing. I also wanted to flag um, last year that animal rights activists kept running onto sports fields to gain attention. And the NFL season coming around again, I think it's, it's gonna happen again, they're gonna try it again. It's how they get attention. Um, Security knows to look out for them, but if they are able to get any attention and a media pick set up, they've won in their eyes. They're gaining attention for their cause. Someone's gonna Google who is that, what is their cause, and it's gonna link to a story about what they do, why they believe it, and they're gonna convince someone to go to their side. Um, so look out for that. When, uh, again, NFL season kicks back up, I do expect that you will see more activists running onto the field. Another big one, and this is one the Alliance really focuses on, is restaurant retail pressure. Um, so years ago, we would always see undercover videos week after week after week, and we don't really see them that often anymore. But when we do, they name a brand. They say this was a McDonald's farm, this was a Walmart farm. And so really the activist groups have learned to get the attention to really move that goalpost. They need to tie the farm to the restaurant brand name. No, tie it to the name that consumers know. And so we've seen that, um, that's one way they target restaurant retail. They've also come up with reports. And so again, animal rights groups forming coalitions together, putting out reports. This, port, this report in particular, the Business Benchmark on Farm Animal Welfare, ranks different restaurant retail companies, so they give them scores based on what they believe are their animal welfare policies. So whatever's publicly available on, their, on the restaurant retail uh, chain, chain's website, the animal rights group goes in and uh, studies it and gives them a score based on how great they think it is. And so they get more points if they have more plant-based options. And so that just kind of gives you the idea of what the intention of the report is. And so they take this report, they use it to uh, go to investors of those companies um, and pressure them that way. We also see a lot of uh, activist groups trying to play referee or play um, kind of hall monitor with the animal rights, with the restaurant retail groups. You know, when a restaurant retail group makes a policy, say it's cage free, if they're not gonna stick to the timeline that they've identified, maybe it's 2025, 50% of their eggs are gonna be cage free. The animal rights groups are keeping track of that and reaching out to those restaurant retailers saying, hey, remember you said yes to this thing I, I told you to do? So we're seeing that as well. It's really animal rights groups trying to kind of keep tabs on the, on the restaurant retail community and pressure them that way. Now getting into legislation, again, some groups are very prevalent in legislation, while other groups rely on kind of radical protesting and things like that. We're seeing more overlap. We're seeing a lot of the more radical groups really go back to using legislation in their tactics. And so on uh, one side of your screen, you'll see quotes from HSUS, who has always been very heavily involved in legislation. Uh, they've said everything from, you know, they're reaching into their toolbox, using everything they can. The most single import, the most single most important thing you can do is build a relationship with your legislator. So they're aware of that. We all want more laws for animals. And then finally, and I really want you to focus on, on this one, is you can change the world with a local ordinance. So I'll get into some examples of that in a minute, um, but that is really a key tactic that we're seeing right now from the animal rights movement, is really focusing on the local ordinances. And you can see on the other side of your screen, that's one of the more uh, most radical groups, Direct Action Everywhere. Um, they are using not only protests, but also calling on the governor of California to put a mor moratorium on farms and processing plants. Um, so that's their call to action there. Some of the trends in the legislation that we're seeing that I wanted to bring to your radar are, of course, ballot initiatives. We've seen several of them. Uh, they're targeting states with a little production um, that's in question. So when they introduce the ballot initiative, not many uh, facilities or farms are really going to be impacted in that state. They're oversimplifying topics and relying on that emotion to really grab the attention of whether it be policymakers or consumers to then sign on to those ballot initiatives and really just bypassing that traditional legislative process. Again, they're starting at the local level. And so 
One example of this is uh, Direct Action Everywhere actually got California to ban fur. So they can't sell fur, uh, can't produce fur in the state of California anymore. It's the first state in all 50 to uh, pass this type of law. And so what they did is they got towns and cities in California first to go ahead and say, okay, you know, we'll sign on to this. We don't want fur in our county or our city or our town. And then they took it to Sacramento to the state level and said, okay, look at all these cities that have signed on to this. They agree, so why, don't, why doesn't the state of California now agree? And that's how they got that passed. And that's really the strategy that they're going to go back to to get whatever they want passed, is really start at the local level, get into all those little cities and towns that it might not affect, that they don't really care either way on the issue, and then use it as precedent to take to the state level. And then ultimately, uh, their goal is the federal level once they get a bunch of states to pass something. So that's really the key tactic we're seeing that I wanted to get on your radar. Uh, key topics on legislation that they're trying to introduce and get passed, housing, space requirements, uh, antibiotic use, uh, so whether it be restrictions or reporting requirements, just making it more difficult for veterinarians to use antibiotics, uh, farm size and expansion re uh, restrictions, the farm protection, and then also animal personhood. So this one is more um, on the extreme side. So basically right now they are focused on granting courtroom animal advocates. So maybe an, an animal, they're bringing a case to the court on behalf of an animal is what they're doing. Um, and ultimately what they want to do is get an animal bill of rights passed. So similar like humans, all of us have the bill of rights, they want a version for animals. And so that is kind of their, their marching orders that they're doing. The next campaign. So legislatively, uh, just last month, this was discussed at a uh, animal rights conference in California. And so what they did is during a workshop there, they asked participants to research variations in animal cruelty statutes across the United States and identify, take a highlighter, and identify all those exemptions for animal agriculture. Those are the ones that they're going to focus on. Those are the ones that are going to see campaigns coming out. So that is what they have said is their next focus, is really identifying all those exemptions for animal agriculture, whether it be housing, um, tethering, whatever it might be. You know, it's okay. It's not okay for companion animals, but there's an exemption for animal agriculture under good animal husbandry practices. They want to identify all those and then bring campaigns to those states and those cities. State ballot initiatives, um, I think we'll see more of these, uh, definitely on the 2024, November 2024 ballot, um, especially in Oregon. Uh, the Oregon ballot initiative 13 was dropped. They've already refiled uh, what is going to be Oregon uh, proposal three, or petition three, um, to get passed. And so also the Colorado Pause Act was paused. Um, but also there's a new one that um, was introduced as a proposal in Denver, Colorado in April. This one says that there should be no processing facilities in Denver. And there is one processing facility in Denver, Colorado. It's a land processing facility, so it would impact that state. And so really we need to keep an eye on these state ballot initiatives. Yes, they're in California. Yes, they're on the West Coast. It's going to set precedent if they get passed, and it's going to come to the East Coast. And so really keeping an eye on, you know, you think maybe California, it's kind of crazy out there. It's, it's all going to come over just like it comes over initially from um, across the, the ocean from the UK. Um, and so that's what I would recommend is really keep an eye on not only North Carolina legislation, but your neighbor, neighboring states, but also the West Coast. Um, I think we can learn a lot and learn about, you know, what we might be up against one day and what might be set as precedent one day that we need to be prepared for. Implementation is also a key issue right now with California Prop 12, of course, was challenged but ultimately upheld by the Supreme Court. Um, and the California uh, courts put into place uh, saying that after July 1st, all pigs processed after that must be Prop 12 compliant in the state of California. So 11 governors representing about 54% of the U.S. Uh, pork's production came together, wrote a letter to the federal policymakers saying that we need to reintroduce the EATS Act, which would basically um, kind of flip California Prop 12. Um, and so a lot of animal rights groups are talking about that right now. So if you just Google EATS Act, you'll see a ton of conversation about that, uh, claiming it's just a Republican issue. And so um, I encourage you to look that up. But also Massachusetts question three, this was, um, I'm pretty sure, uh, introduced before Prop 12 came to place. So this was one of the first ballot initiatives really discussing uh, 
how animals should be raised. And so it was delayed until Prop 12 had a decision made, and so now that Prop 12's decision has been made, it is expected to move on. This was another state where it uh, is about spacing requirements. And what it says, it really impacted only maybe one or two egg farms in the state. And so looking at that, making sure that when these ballot initiatives get passed, again, they're going to those states that maybe don't have a lot of ag production, or maybe only have one or two facilities that might be impacted. Um, and so in getting those states to flip, again, to use those as precedent to go to other states, that it would impact agriculture immensely. So what can we do about all this? I think the first and foremost and maybe most important thing we can do is really stay informed. Uh, stay informed, again, not only what's happening in North Carolina, um, but also what's happening in all of your local towns and cities. Again, they're starting at that local level, and so don't um, make it a surprise when something comes to the state level to be introduced because it's been passed at all these local levels. Um, but also, again, keep an eye on your neighboring states, what's being introduced there, what's being introduced in California. While the activist groups are very active there, agriculture is also very active there, there as well. It's a big state with a lot of agriculture. Um, also, building those proactive relationships with your legislators. Don't wait until you're angry about something to go meet them, to go talk to them. Um, invite them out to your farm. You know, if there's any speaking opportunities to get in front of them, take advantage of those because likely is the animal rights groups are already knocking on their doors, talking to their aides, trying to get meetings with them. Also, once again, stay engaged at that local level, not just the state level, but your city and town levels and the mun municipalities, um, and really building trust within your community. The last speaker spoke about um, kind of your bank account. And so another analogy is build your trust bank. Always be depositing in that trust bank, you know, going to local events, sponsoring local events, things like that. So when something comes up, an issue comes up, a video comes out, a campaign happens, your local community members already know who you are, they know who your farm is, and they believe you and want to listen to you and your side of the story before they automatically believe whatever the animal rights group is saying. And then finally, build coalitions with other organizations. It's always important to really, again, hear what other organizations, other industry groups are going through uh, so you can learn from them and really we're all in this together. One way you can stay informed, uh, we do have a legislative map on our website, animalagalliance.org, and so we keep track of all the legislation across the country and federally that impacts animal agriculture. Uh, we don't lobby, but we definitely keep track of it because, I, like I've said, it's tied to animal rights. Animal rights groups are behind some of these initiatives, proposing these ballot measures. And so keeping tabs on them, really just providing an educational resource of who is behind this ballot initiative and what would it do. Uh, so I encourage you to look that up. We also uh, update this regularly. There's a current issues tab. So you know what are the top 10 pieces of legislation that need to be on your radar? And you can also sign up for our newsletter. And so you'll get, again, those top pieces of legislation each month that you should know about. And I thank you for your time.